So, in this video, uh, I like to go over logging. I took a look into how we can do logging in Rust, and it seems pretty straightforward. I'm kind of happy about that. So yeah, let's get it. All right. So, where did I start? Um, in the Rust cookbook, there is a debugging section. So it's under Development Tools, Debugging, Log Messages. When you come here, one of the first things you see is that they use Environment Logger and Log. Um, I first thought it, thought it was kind of awkward that you had to use both. And the reason why I say you have to use both is if you go to Environment Logger, oh, let me go to the crate. If you go to the crate, you can see that in the uh, Carmel dot cargo.toml file, you have to have both installed. So it's like, okay, so they're being used together. That's fine. Um, and what does it state here? The log crate provides logging utilities. The environment logger crate configures logging via an environment variable. The log debug macro works like other standard format formatted strings. So let's break that down. The log crate provides log uti logging utilities, and by logging utilities, they mean a bunch of macros that you can use. So like the bug is used here. I believe there's info, warn, and just a whole slew of them. And those macros all work like any of the standard format, meaning that you could use the string and then um, pass in variables, just like you would for a formatted string. All right. And then environment logger. Craig configures logging via environment variable, meaning that there is environment variable that you use to set the uh, logging level. So here they set the logging level to debug, and then they did cargo run. And it didn't have to be cargo run. They could just did it. They could just ran the binary directly, either or. Cool, so that makes sense. So here you get to see the basic sort of workflow. Um, you have the environment logger, you init it, initialize it. Initializing, initialization for a logger typically happens, should happen only once, and it typically happens at the very beginning of your program. And then they ran a function, and in the function there was a logging statement. And if you want to be able to see that logging statement, then you have to have the log level set. In the log level setting, I'll, I'll go over that in a little bit. But um, so that's the example they have here. I think a better example is the one they have on the uh, environment logger documentation. So if you scroll up to the top of the documentation, right? The first thing they come out was this, this, which is a full example. It has the imports, which is nice. Um, they note that the log crate is an external crate, or external crate, and you want to be able to use the macros from log. Cool. Noted. Um, here they also import the level from log because they use it here explicitly for example purposes. Okay. The workflow kind of follows the same way as the other example. We have the initialization of the logger. We have the debug macro, which I believe is from log. We have the error macro, which I also believe is from log. And log enabled, which I also believe is from log. It was checked to see if the logger, uh, the current logger that is set, uh, is enabled for specified logging level. And the specified logging level is from log. Um, I believe it's just an enum where each logging level is associated with a number. And you kind of just compare to see if you're lower than said number. So here we have debug error and info, right? And when you run this, you have to have the environment variable set. So the environment variable, um, the default one is Rust log. I believe you can change it. In their example, they did use the binary directly. Um, if you do, if you set it to error, then you should only see the error one, right? Because I believe that's the the lowest level or highest priority, but lowest level. In terms of numbering, it's wonky. Actually, let, let's find that the levels real quick, so we know explicitly. Because I mentioned them, but meh. So we go to log, go to documentation. In the documentation, where is it? 
level. Cool. And see the source for it. Error is one. Warning, I believe it's two. Info is three. Debug is four. And then trace is five. So they're in that order. So error is the, I would say the highest priority, but lowest number. So I think I was correct in stating that. All right, let's go back here. So if you set it to error, and you're setting it to one, uh, then you should only see this one. This one is too high, and this one's also too high. If you set it to info, info, let's go back to here. Info is before debug. So info is three and debug is four. So we should see, if, when we set it to info, we should also see warnings and we should also see errors, but we should not see debug statements or trace. And they show that here as well. So we set it to info. We then see the error and info message. Um, so error is still printed here. Info, we check to see if it's enabled. It is. And then we print it out. Now we set it to debug. Debug, if you go back to this list, is two, three, four. So yeah, then we see everything in three. We, saw, we see all the infos, we see all the warnings, we see all the errors. We should see those. So coming back to here, we note we see the debug, error, and info message. They're all there. Um, also, uh, at least in terms of the, the documentation for the this crate, they go over how to set it for a uh, module. So you can use this syntax with module name and then equals to the level that you want to set it to. Or if you just want to have all levels on, then you can just use the module name and that would work. Uh, one thing that's is really, really cool about this is the testing. So you can um, have your debug statements or at least your, your logging statements captured in when you run your test harness. So in the documentation, they have this example for test. And let's take a look at this real quick. Just a regular testing setup. They have an init function for their testing setup. In there, they do the this line, um, which is you note that it is a test, true, and then they try to initialize it. And then in their test, they run that initializer. And then they have the info macro, which is one of the log level statements, right? And then you can run your test and then you can have this captured by your test harness. And if you want to see it, one, it should be noted that you still need to use the environment variable. So it will be rust log, I believe it was. Yeah, rust log. And you can set it to info and then you will do cargo test and that will allow you to see it. And if that doesn't allow you to see it, it's going to be captured. You can still do the, the dash dash space dash dash no capture. And let me just demonstrate that. I think I have it in my terminal. Let me find it real quick. Less logging. I can make this big. A little bit bigger and the logging example so let me go there then source main so you can see that I wrote it out here's the main that they have and here's the test I added it here um, and then I wanted to show you running this so it is there we see it let's get out of this so if we do cargo test, nothing pops up. If we do cargo test, dash, 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 no capture, still don't see it. If you do rust underscore log equals info, now we see it. And it's right there, you can see the info logger this record will be captured by cargo test let me just take out no capture to see if that still works that way no so in order to see it you have to put the no capture flag on your test good to know 
Uh, yeah, so there was something else I wanted to cover. On the In the Rust cookbook, they go over debug statements, they go over error, but they also go over have, writing your own custom logger, which for this you need to implement the log trait from log. And there are three methods to that, right? There's enabled, log, and plus. And writing implementation for the trade is pretty straightforward. Um, enable just allows you to know, or it allows the logger to know when it should print to screen or when it should log something. So if you want to have any sort of restraint, you should write it here, return a Boolean, true or false. If you always wanted to write, then you could just return true. Uh, log prints out the format that you want it in and it should be noted that record seemingly does most of the hard work for you in terms of capturing data you just have to decide how you want to lay it out and they do the self that enable because uh, I believe it's not guaranteed that this is always going to be ran before this so you should probably do it in here as well and flush they don't have an example of that here but from my understanding, plus is used when your logger has to share resources with someone else or write to something very specific. So if you scroll down a little bit more, right, there is the Unix syslog. And that is used for like writing to the Unix logger, I believe. So if they're writing to something very specific, then they should have an implementation for uh, flush and to see that I went to how did I find it so if you go to the log crate at the very bottom they give you a list of all of the loggers that that you should be using in executables to uh, do your logging and one of them is the syslog crate and in the syslog crate they have a basic logger and I just looked at the source of the source for that um, so just a quick overview of what the logger is or does they seemingly have different logging backends haven't looked into that so I don't know what kind of backends they have but backends they all have this logger thing which is probably their local implementation of logger uh, it is a mutex so that implies that this is going to be a resource that's shared among different um, loggers or can be used in different places at once, but they're writing to the same thing. And arc. Arc is needed because I think the requirement for the log for trait may be that it is send and sync. Um, and if you're going to have a reference counter that is also send and sync, then you have to use arc as requirement. Anyway, moving down to here, right? The implementation of log. So they have enabled, and this is a basic logger, so they just always set it to true. Um, they have log, which they have some stuff here, which I don't understand completely why they did everything. I don't understand in detail why they did everything they did, but I don't think it's important. Um, it's important for them, but not important for me. I came here for the plus implementation. So plus, you can see that they have their self.logger.lock, so locking on the mutex, so nobody else can use the resource at that time. Unwrapping it, so they have access to it, and then getting to the back end, whichever back end implementation they're using, and then flushing everything that may or may not be in their buffer and writing it to wherever it needs to go. So that if you want to see an example of plus implementation, you can probably just come here and look through the source code all right so i think we covered we covered the basics of environment logger and we covered the the trait right log trait and how to implement your own but they have an example here and this works i, I went through this myself um one thing we didn't cover is some of like the minor differences between or the relationship between these loggers these logging implementations and log. Uh, 
So the first hint you get at that is if you go to the environment logger in under usage, it states that, let me make that a little bit bigger. Environment logger makes sense when you use in executables. So binary projects. Libraries should use the log crate instead. Okay. So for executables, you should use a logger implementation and there's a long list. You have many options. If you're writing a library, then you should use the stuff in log. And when I say the stuff in log, I believe they mean the macros explicitly. So when I went to log, right, they have usage in libraries. And I believe this is a library. I've never used it before, but I've heard of it. Um, and they use the macros. Cool. So there's a separation. In executables, use the uh, implementations and libraries use log directly. Another thing to note is if you go to the beginning of the crate, this statement, right? A logging facade, oh, let's start from the top. A Rust library providing a lightweight logging facade. Facade is just a computer data algorithm, data structure term. Um, I have it open in the wiki because it's easier to see an implementation than it is to describe. More or less, it's a way for a client to ask for something here. And this thing, could, this is the facade, looks at its internal representations, um, the different classes that it has access to, figures out which one you more or less want, and then provides it back. So in summary, it's kind of like uh, this thing has the ability to return multiple different types of classes depending on the requirements that the client provides. So let's go back. A logging facade provides a single logging API that abstracts over the actual logging implementation. So this is a single logging API that all the different implementations are going to be using. Cool. Libraries can use the logging API provided by this crate and the customer of those libraries can choose the logging implementation that is most suitable for its use case. So basically what we just said and what we've seen so far. Um, from my understanding, that's pretty much all you really need to know about this. And with that, I think I've covered everything for the most part. Yeah, uh, this looks pretty straightforward and nice to use. I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> so with that, we reached the end of the video. If you liked the video, hit like, subscribe, yada, yada, yada. Outside of that, peace.